Welcome everyone, I'm Penny Lewis, the Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar, Organic Lawn Care, Healthier Lawns for People, Pets, and Pollinators. This is part of the Focus on Sustainability webinar series, developed by a group of organizations known regionally for their quality ecological education. By collaborating on these webinars, we expand the reach of our regional programs across the country. In case you're not familiar with our organizations, they are largely nonprofit and volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, Deep Roots Kansas City, and Rescape California. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Mary Travellini. Mary is the manager of the Organic Lawn and Landscape Program for Montgomery County, Maryland's new Organic Lawn and Landscaping Program. Mary's wide-ranging background includes degrees in natural resources and landscape architecture, and she has experience with invasive plant management, landscape design, trail construction, and stormwater management. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Penny. So I appreciate everybody listening in today and folks who are listening in the future on a recording. Uh, but I will go through a bunch of information about organic lawn care. Uh, why it's a great, just giving you a gratuitous picture of me uh, because sometimes it's nice to see who's talking on the phone. Uh, but let's get into it. I'm going to start mostly talking about lawn soils and then get into organic lawn care tips. A lot of the reasons that I talk about lawn soils is because this is really the most important and critical factor for a healthy lawn and particularly for an organic lawn. Here in Montgomery County, we recently passed a, uh, a new pesticide law, and that is actually banning the use of synthetic chemicals on lawns for most cosmetic reasons. It's a very big change. We're the first major municipality in the United States to have a law of the scale. There are some other smaller municipalities throughout the country that have enacted such bans, uh, but we are really sort of leading the way, and a lot of eyes are on us in terms of seeing how this works out and how it benefits uh, people within the landscape. Because of this law, we've really gotten into the lawn care arena, which is not typically something that's focused on a lot in environmental programming. Uh, but what's interesting is that it really should be focused on a lot more. So in Montgomery County, almost a third of our landscape is covered by turf grass. And that's a lot of grass. As a lot of us know, uh, turf grass is the largest agricultural crop throughout the United States. There's more turf grass than there is corn. And it's uh, covering a lot of our landscape. While there is a big focus on converting lawns to other areas for pollinators, for habitats, for vegetable gardens, et cetera, the reality is that lawns are really a part of our landscape and they will be through the future. So we need to capitalize on how we can use them best for stormwater management, for habitat, uh, for the benefit of people. Uh, it's actually interesting how many, so there we go, how many benefits there are to environmental, to organic lawns. And when I, when I talk about this, I really focus on what an organic lawn could provide. And what I'm talking about is getting a lawn to the healthiest place it can be, particularly within the soil. So what's interesting is that lawns actually do play a big role in offsetting climate change. Native grasslands alone store 50% more carbon per year than forest per acre. So the goal would be to deepen your lawn roots. The more organic soil you have, the weaker the soil, the healthier the soil, the more lawn roots you can get in there. Uh, and a lot of that is that lawns are turning over each year a lot of material, and it's going back into the soil as a source of carbon. So uh, the above ground roots, or sorry, the above ground parts and the below ground parts of grass roots, as they degrade, they go back into the soil. Whereas you think about a tree when it loses its leaves, much of that doesn't actually go back into the soil, it goes back into the tree, which is a fabulous thing uh, for storing carbon, but actually there's a lot of more, a lot more turnover, turnover, turnover of carbon storage in the soil from lawns. The other thing is that they can improve air quality. So in Maryland, lawns actually trap 12 million pounds of airborne dust. And what I usually do is I sit there with my fingers where I'm in front of people and weave them around like they're little grass leaves. Uh, but again, while trees are fabulous, most of them are losing their leaves for a good part of the year, whereas lawn grasses are always up, so they're constantly trapping airborne dust. And that's an important thing, particularly in urban areas. 
they're producing oxygen. So um, again, I love trees. <laughs> I never want to say to somebody, pick out a tree and put in a lawn. Uh, but the data actually shows that they produce three and a half times more oxygen than trees per acre. And again, I'm talking about very healthy lawn that's well maintained. It's lush, it's dense, it's got good roots. Uh, it's nice and long. They also cap can capture and infiltrate stormwater. So in urban areas, again, very important surface, particularly if you have those healthy soils. And again, in urban environments, they provide erosion control compared to their ground. So there are a lot of benefits to lawns. And I think what is most important is taking care of them so that they can actually provide this benefit. All right. So let's talk about maintaining the lawn, and this really starts by understanding soil biology. So this is actually going to be a little lesson in soil biology first before I get into some of the tips about organic lawn care. So the biggest thing is that our soil is really stardust. The soil that we have out there is really misunderstood, and it really should be appreciated a lot more than it actually is. Uh, so one tablespoon of healthy soil has more organisms in it than there are people on Earth, and that's uh, pretty remarkable in terms of what's just going on in that one little tablespoon. There's over 70,000 types of soil just in the United States alone, so a lot of diversity in our soil. 10% of the world's carbon is stored in the soil. That's more than is stored in the atmosphere and terrestrial vegetation combined, so a very important source of uh, carbon storage. It can take a minimum of 500 years to build one inch of topsoil, uh, but yet half the topsoil on the planet has been lost in the last 150 years. And in the United States, we lose six pounds of soil through erosion for every pound of food we produce. Uh, so we're really um, losing a lot of soil, healthy soil every year, and we're really ignoring it. But again, in a healthy lawn, if we can maintain that soil, if we can build that organic material up, we can help to benefit the environment. So soil organisms that are in the soil are really, really, really important. Uh, they decompose organic matter. They break down humates to form stable carbon in the soil. They'll bind soil with secretions, so many of them excrete sort of a glue, and this increases infiltration and holds soil moisture in there. They immobilize nutrients so they don't wash out into our waterways. Uh, they actually convert nutrients into soluble forms for plants. They protect plant roots from disease, so they like to keep their habitat. They're very competitive, so they'll fight off disease organisms that might attack the roots of our plants. They stimulate the growth of bacteria through grazing, so many of them will actually reproduce other forms of bacteria just by, by eating in their gut. They'll help distribute fungi and bacteria through the soil, through the movement that they do, and they can shape habitat by burrowing in the soil. So we're going to talk a little bit about nutrient exchange in the soil, and this is really important to understand when we start looking at what's in our soil, what's important, and uh, how to read a soil test. So the biggest thing is clay. Clay um, are minerals such as aluminum and silicon. They combine into plate-like structures like you see in the picture on the left, and these are held together by electrical charges. There's negative charges and positive charges. So clay has a negative charge. Uh, sand and silt have no charge. They're neutral. And many, but not all, plant nutrients are positively charged. So the clay in the soil with the negative charge is very important to holding on to nutrients. Uh, and all these nutrients are fixed to clay and organic particles through these electrical charges. If you look at how the charges work, we're going to talk about cations and anions. So cations are your hydrogen, aluminum, calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium. Those are some of your top uh, cations. The rules of cations are that the smaller the particle, the more tightly it is held to the soil, and the higher number of charges, the more tightly it's held to the soil. So if you look at the image at the bottom, you can see that calcium, which is that little green one, has two positive charges, and it's stuck onto two negative charges in the soil colloid, whereas hydrogen, which is yellow, only has one uh, single charge. But hydrogen is very small. Um, but it only has a single charge, whereas aluminum has three charges. Uh, so these can be tightly bound to the soil, very hard to get off, uh, but they are different sizes with different charges. So that hierarchy that you see up there is that hydrogen is way more tightly held than aluminum, and sodium is very loosely held compared to hydrogen. So you can see that's what we call the hierarchy of affinity. 
So these cations are constantly exchanging places on soil colloids as things are happening within the soil. And these are things you and I cannot witness <laughs> um, while we're standing above the soil or doing anything to the soil. But this is constantly happening. And as soon as we do something to the soil, we change where those cations are in, in place. And I'll get into that in a little while. So anions are the negatively charged particles. They cannot stick to clay. As I mentioned, clay is really important for most plant nutrients, but there are some common anions that are very important uh, for, for uh, cation exchange and for nutrients in soils. They're fixed mostly by organic matter. So organic matter tends to have the positive charge, and those negative anions will be sticking to organic matter. And it can also be as an, uh, stuck as insoluble compounds. So they're stuck within rocks, for example, or phosphorus can be bound to aluminum. So some of the common phosphates and nitrates, which are really important to plants, they're available only in the negative form to plants. But they'll wash out of the soil if they're not immediately taken up by plants or if they're not fixed by organic matter. So we want both the clay and we want the organic matter to be in the soil as well. We also need microorganisms, so microorganisms will fix these uh, negative anions as well. So when we look at pH, this is the first thing that people tend to focus on when they look at a soil test and other things they talk about, oh, pH, 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 you have to sweeten the soil, you have to add lime every year, et cetera, et cetera. The challenge is that most people don't understand what pH is. So pH is a measurement of the hydrogen atom sticks to the soil. Hydrogen itself is not a plant nutrient. So I will repeat, hydrogen is not a plant nutrient. The other ones are plant nutrients. Hydrogen has no value to a plant. A low pH, which is down at the fourth range, this means it's fully saturated with hydrogen. It means there's no space on the soil colloids for nutrients to be stuck there. A high pH on the other end at seven is means there's no hydrogen stuck to the soil and it's all nutrients. Both of those ranges all the way at the end are not very good for, for us and not very good for most plants, uh, but there are ranges in between. So one of the reasons we don't want to change the pH is that when we add limestone to raise the pH, and I'm just using limestone as an example, limestone has calcium. So calcium in large amounts will replace the hydrogen that's stuck to the soil, but when it does that, it also knocks off those less, uh, less uh, less tightly held nutrients like magnesium, magnesium, and other important plant nutrients. And when those get washed out um, or washed off of the soil colloid, then they can wash out of the soil completely when it rains and ends up into our waterways. So it's a big ouch, it's a big no-no to adjust the pH unless the pH is at such a strong range that you literally cannot grow grass. Otherwise, we just want to work on uh, buffering the pH that's in there and working with other things within the soil so that it can work for the plants that are out there. But if a soil test shows that your pH is just a little bit off from ideal and the advice comes back to change it, unless you can't grow a graph there, my advice is do not touch the pH. Uh, once you start messing with that, you start messing with all of these other nutrients and you start um, causing a seesaw back and forth. And I also want to talk about what pH means in different types of soils. So if we look at these two graphs, on the left, we have soil with a high mineral content, and on the right, we have soil with a high organic content. And you look at those bars, the wider the bars of the nutrient, it shows how readily available that is to a plant in that pH range. So in a soil with a high mineral content on the left, that neutral pH of six and a half to seven is where most of those important plant nutrients are most available. But if we go over to the right and we look at the soil with a high organic content, the plants are more, the nutrients are more available at a much lower pH. So isn't that interesting, right? So we have all these folks telling us to adjust the pH, but they know nothing about the organic content and the mineral content in our soil. So if we think about what do blueberries want, do they actually want a low pH? Most of the belief is that, oh, they need a low pH. Actually, is it high nutrients? Because at a low pH, they can access more limited nutrients in their native soils. The native soils of blueberries are highly organic. So we're looking at a low pH, but we're also looking at a high organic content. And so that's what makes plant nutrients available. It's not just the microorganisms, it's not just the pH, it's about the mineral content and the organic content. Because we talked earlier about 
the positively charged nutrients, the negatively charged nutrients, et cetera, and how they're moving around on the soil colloid. So really important, again, just to emphasize that we don't want to sit around and be messing with our pH. So let's talk about how to care for a lawn organically. A lot of these tips are um, basic to many people who've been caring for lawns for a while, uh, but for many folks, we just need a, a reminder or uh, take out some of the myths that are there in terms of caring for a lawn organically. So the first thing that we tell people is to mow high and keep your lawn blades sharp. Um, taller grass actually shades out weeds. The taller grass also captures more sun to turn it into energy. And it also transpires less water by keeping the ground cool. So if we have a very short grass, we're going to expose the soil to solar radiation. It's going to dry out faster. It's going to heat up faster. And also the plants are going to have to transfer it more because we're trying to keep cool from that hot ground. We want to keep our grass above three inches, ideally. This applies for anywhere pretty much in the United States. It's not just a regional thing. We also want to um, cut with sharp grass blades. So we should be sharpening our grass blades about every 10 to 12 hours of use or any time that it looks like the grass is getting dull with that little brown shredded tip, uh, that is a sign that you need to sharpen your grass blades. Or, sorry, sharpen your lower blades. So the sharper the grass cut, it means it's going to heal faster. It's going to evaporate less water because it's got that sharp edge. And it's going to require less energy overall. It will also prevent attack from diseases. So when the tips of our grasses are frayed, there's more surface area. So more surface area means the plant needs more energy to heal. It also means that more water can evapotranspirate from all those cut cell edges. And it also means it's more vulnerable to disease. So we want to have nice, sharp grass blades. Recommend that people oftentimes would have two blades so you can switch them out before taking them to get sharpened. You can also learn how to sharpen them at home. And you can also keep uh, objects off of your lawn, like pick up pine cones and other things along the way. Especially when you're mowing a lot of leaves to chop them up and keep them in the lawn, that can often dull your blades a little bit faster. So again, just keeping in mind that you want to keep an eye out on uh, how that grass blade is being cut and sharpen that. Another cultural practice is to overseed the lawn every fall. Now, I put as needed. Some lawns are so lush and so healthy that they don't really need new grass. Uh, but the average lawn grass lives about seven years. So we're talking some live less, some live a little bit more. We're constantly abusing it by cutting. So we want to overseed as often as possible. In some locations, you might be able to overseed your round just by doing spot treatments. But generally, in the fall, uh, for a lot of East Coast, is the best time uh, to be overseeding. Anytime you have spots where weeds can invade, you want to be overseeding. So a really dense and healthy lawn can have up to 6,000 blades of grass in square foot. And that's a lot of grass in one square foot. Uh, if it's lower, you know, if you're getting onto the low range, that's where weeds can invade. So weeds are actually not a lawn test. They're simply just filling in a niche where grass can't go. For anyone who's ever tried to kill grass or remove grass or keep it out of your garden beds, you'll know how aggressive lawns can be. Uh, that turf grass is incredibly aggressive and will fight back just about any weed that you can think at it as long as it's dense. So you don't want to have bare ground where uh, seeds can germinate and you don't want to have a lot of um, open space within there so you have bare soil. Uh, even bare soil that might not be obvious to the naked eye. Uh, if it's not a dense lawn, it's not going to help you with weeds. So overseed, overseed. Another thing is to limit watering. Some people are under the belief that they should constantly be watering their lawn when it's in the summer, but you actually only want to water during establishment of new grass or during drought. Uh, when watering, it's important to water deeply using an inch or more of water in that silk. If you actually do frequent shallow watering, this can actually encourage weeds and discourage your grass from growing. So deep soak and only during uh, establishment of lawns and during drought. Lawns also in our area, at least, they really need a summer dormancy. They need rest. Uh, give them a chance to rest and work on what's going on in the reeds below ground and not be forcing them to always be taking energy from the reeds to be green above ground. So letting uh, lawn grasses go dormant when they're supposed to. Now, I say summer dormancy because most of the people I'm talking to have fescue grasses, uh, but if you have lawns that are cool season versus warm season, they have different dormancy periods. 
So another thing is taking soil samples. This is very important in cases, especially where there are nutrient management laws, but this is also going to help you know what your lawn needs in terms of nutrients. So when you take a soil sample, uh, they're very inexpensive. They tend to be eight to ten dollars in general. You want to take them in different areas of the yard uh, if you have different uh, conditions for your lawn. It'll measure your levels of nutrients. It'll measure your organic content. It'll make sure that you're uh, following laws, especially for phosphorus. And in our state, we have a lot of uh, phosphorus restrictions. You can also get special tests that can measure, measure the living biology, and you can also help diagnose test problems through nutrient measurement. So typically, a test problem is usually a nutrient problem. Uh, so soil samples will come back very quickly. I usually within a couple of days to a couple of weeks, and uh, you'll be able to look at whether there's a nutrient problem in there. So make sure you take soil samples, be able to use them year to year to look at that. If you want to understand quickly how to read a soil sample, there's a lot of resources and information online, uh, but the website that I'll share at the end, we actually have a video that we've done ourselves, which is really good, very simple, three minutes long, can tell you about how to read that soil sample and understand more. And then you can always talk to an expert about your soil sample. The big thing about a soil sample is do not ever show or do not ever follow the recommendations that they share on uh, your soil sample results because those are generalized uh, and you just want to ignore those completely. Okay, so another thing is that if you have compacted soils, you want to core aerate those. So how do you know if you have a compacted soil? Typically when it's not a moist day out, Take a screwdriver if it's relatively difficult to put it into the soil. It's a pretty good chance that your soil is compacted. Uh, this is a picture of aeration. It's a machine that goes over. It pulls out these little plugs. They look like little goose poops all over the lawn. You want to go at least two or three times, if not up to five or six times across an area. So you're actually going to be punching a lot of holes within that soil. It's going to provide air for microorganisms. It's going to open areas for compost to mix into the soil profile if you're adding compost or amendments. It's also going to add um, great to do if you're doing composting and overseeding at the same time. It helps the compost and seed fall into there. And it also provides for water to get into the soil profile. So you may have to do this for a couple of years on compacted soils. If you're doing it more than three or four years in a row, chances are that you have a different problem with compaction. Uh, chances are you have a nutrient problem or other reasons why that soil is compacted. Um, talking about the general front yard, backyard lawn, if it's, a, if it's an athletic field, it might be a different story. Uh, but you actually don't want to be aerating year after year after year. And the reason for that is that the fungi hyphae that are going through under the ground that are really important, they form miles of hyphae, and whenever you uh, core aerate, you can break up those hyphae. So if we're doing this year after year after year, we can also be disrupting the soil biology, and we really shouldn't have to do this if we're doing other management tools on our lawn to make sure that we help the soil. Another thing is adding compost. So this buffers the pH. It increases the cation exchange for nutrients. It increases carbon uh, storage in the soil and also carbon sources for micro microorganisms to eat. Compost will supply a lot of micronutrients. It brings microorganisms with it, and it helps to fight disease. In places where you have a large area or you have restrictions on compost for fertilizer loss, you can try compost tea. Compost tea is a lot cheaper. There's no phosphorus concerns. It's very low in terms of labor intensity to add compost tea. So in small areas, uh, you might find that the compost is doable in larger areas or just with time, with management, how strong of a back you have, whether or not you have a company that does this for you, you might want to switch over to compost tea. So let's talk about soil nutrients and how can you keep these soil nutrients high for grass. There's a lot of organic matter out there that can be used. I tend to not talk about synthetic materials at all, whether it comes to fertilizers or pest control. I just talk about the organic means because there's so much that's out there. So we're talking about nitrogen. So we've got the NPK and N is the nitrogen, and lawns need a lot of nitrogen. They're nitrogen hogs. Uh, the grass clippings alone can return between 50 to 100% of the nitrogen that's needed for a lawn. And leaves also return a hefty amount of nitrogen. So leaving all your grass clippings behind. Unless you're having like a wedding the next day, there's really no reason to pull up your grass clippings. 
uh, leave them behind. They're free. It's less labor and it's giving all that nitrogen right back as well as the carbon material into the soil. Also trying to mow over as many of your leaves as possible, particularly if you have a mulching mower. If you're in the market for a new mower at any point, look into making sure that you get a mulching mower, which will help to chop up your leaves and your grass into much smaller pieces. They'll break down faster. Also, you can add uh, compost or earthworm castings. These provide nitrogen and the bacteria needed to extract it. Uh, corn gluten, soybean meal, and alfalfa meal are great sources of nitrogen. They're very difficult to get in non-GMO form. So if you're going truly organic, where you need to keep GMOs out of the equation, these might not be a good addition. If you're in a coastal area, seaweed is readily available and a great source. You can also purchase seaweed in other areas and coffee grounds. So if you drink coffee every day, throw it in your compost, throw it right onto your lawn, however you want to get it out there. It's a free source of nitrogen, and now you don't have to deal with putting it in the trash. Uh, clover plants. So we encourage clover uh, to be growing in lawns. Actually, before the advent of all of the uh, pesticides we started using after World War II, clover was actually required in grass seed mixes. It actually contains bacteria on the nodes that kicks nitrogen, like other lagoons do, and it uh, can provide a lot of nitrogen in the soil. So we encourage that. A lot of people these days are using micro clover because it's a smaller clover. It blends in a little bit uh, better with the grass than some of the larger clover species that are out there. There's also an interaction between nematodes and bacteria that can provide another 30 to 50 percent of the nitrogen needed. These can be increased through compost and compost tea. And there's a natural bacteria that grows on grass called azosporilum. You can also purchase these if you need to add some more. Um, and these can fix 30 percent of the nitrogen needed for grass. So as you can see, just between the bacteria that's already on the grass and leaving grass clippings and leaves, you can get pretty much everything you need in terms of the nitrogen on the lawn, uh, but there should never be a need to add something uh, synthetic from the bag. So then phosphorus, we're on the NPK, we're now in the P. Uh, phosphorus, another important thing for grass. So again, grass clippings return 1.8 pounds of phosphorus per thousand square feet within a year. Um, the state, our state law for um, inorganic sources of phosphorus are less than half a pound per thousand square feet. So why wouldn't you just use the grass in your meat when the grass clippings alone are adding way more than you could from a bag? Um, so again, leaves, chopping them up on the lawn, compost, again, great source of phosphorus, might be limited depending on your fertilizer laws. And you can also increase the end of mycorrhizal fungi with compost, and these will help to extract phosphorus that's found in the soil. Uh, organic sources of potassium, so this is the K. Uh, you can add and encourage the growth of the bacteria and fungi that are used to convert this through compost, particularly compost that has fruits, vegetables, and banana peels. Kelp meal and seaweed, again, great source of potassium and can also supply micronutrients at the same time. And then wood ash uh, can also supply potassium and micronutrients. You want to be careful with wood ash because it can raise the pH. Uh, but if the pH in your soil is uh, is not too problematic, you can use wood ash, especially if you have a wood burning stove. Take a little bit of that, add it to your compost, um, dilute it, add it out to your lawn, and that can get you a uh, great source of potassium. So then microorganisms. We mentioned earlier that you need the microorganisms to extract and convert all of these nutrients. Uh, so we want to make sure that we increase those in the soil. Uh, you can add them through compost and earthworm castings and also compost tea. You can buy what's called EM, effective microorganisms, comes in a bottle, typically dilute it and pour it out on the lawn. You can also buy endomycorrhizal fungi. These would be the soil fungi in the soil. Uh, as I mentioned, as a sporulum bacteria, it can be purchased. Not as common as a, a thing to purchase, but it is out there. You can also buy beneficial nematodes to attack and consume insect pests. Uh, and also help convert nutrients. And then if you want some of the larger things, the arthropods, the earthworms, other soil invertebrates, simply um, grabbing a house full of healthy garden or forest soil um, or from your compost can often bring those larger um, microorganisms right into your lawn. So you can mix that in with your compost. When you're adding it, you could scatter it right into the lawn when you're composting overseeding. Uh, you can dig a hole and stick it in however you want to get it there. Uh, just the food from a healthy area nearby might work out for you. 
in sources of carbon. So carbon is really important because this is what microorganisms uh, tend to eat. The ones that are the most important microorganisms at the bottom of the food chain are bacteria, and they eat a lot of carbon, and other things eat carbon as well. So as I mentioned, grass clippings and leaves just leave those behind, great source of carbon. Can, again, can get it through compost, uh, dried seaweed, worm castings have a lot of carbon and they have stable humic acids in them. You can also take sawdust, aged wood chips, or composted newspaper. Another great and free source of carbon is straw. So a lot of times in the fall, particularly, people have those bales that they set out for, you know, Halloween and fall harvest decorations, and they're always like, what do I do with this at the end of the season? Go ahead, take that, scatter it across the lawn, and run your lawnmower over it, and just chop it up into small pieces, and the microorganisms are going to have a field day. They're going to gobble that up and uh, make your lawn nice and lush as well at the same time. I uh, can also use blackstrap molasses. Uh, that's a great source of carbon as well. Uh, then getting into micronutrients, there's a lot of sources of micronutrients. And you, your lawn needs these, but typically your soil samples are not necessarily going to talk about these. But if your lawn has been traumatized, let's say it was a really difficult winter, um, a lot of odd weather, um, maybe you had a couple of events on that soil where you had garden parties, um, maybe you left the little kitty pool out a little too long and traumatized the lawn a little bit. Oftentimes, micronutrients are going to help boost that lawn back to what it needs. I uh, mentioned wood ash. Uh, you can make a wood ash tea. This can supply a lot of the uh, micronutrients that a lawn might need. Again, watch out for pH, uh, but very easy to brew, just like brewing compost tea. You can get sea minerals. Uh, sea minerals contain all the elements on the periodic chart, including 76 minerals. Uh, so sea minerals are just a fantastic boost of micronutrients. Blackstrap molasses contains a lot of trace elements, uh, and they also help to boost soil bacteria. So again, you can make some compost tea, add a little blackstrap molasses, or you can just dilute blackstrap molasses in water and spray that out on your lawn. And then micronutrients vary depending on how your compost is. So if you're really like the compost aficionado who likes to track what you're putting in and try different things, um, keep in mind what's going into your compost pile. So you can you can see some of the uh, minerals there that might come out of some of the things that are sources in your compost pile. Uh, this is my last slide before I go to questions. So Penny's asked that if you have any questions and you haven't typed them into the chat box yet, please type them in, start typing them in now uh, so that we can get to those at the end. Uh, so I'd like to finish off with my top 10 tips for an organic lawn. These are things that I've covered in the entire presentation before. Uh, so really just kind of going through them again. Uh, so mowing your grass high, taller than three inches with sharp blades. Uh, leave, leaving all your glass clippings on the lawn and chopping up as many weeds as you can on your lawn. Overstating the lawn every fall or as needed. Poor aerate if it's hard to push a screwdriver into the soil. Tolerate a few weeds. So if you really want to have an organic lawn, uh, you really want to expect that there's going to be a few garbage weeds in there. Uh, so let's get used to that. Uh, we don't need to be changed by the commercials on television telling us that our lawn simply has to be grass. Uh, and you also want to grow clover because that's going to benefit the lawn. Try to feed and grow your populations of soil microorganisms, all those bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, et cetera. You want to make sure that you feed them and make sure that you're expanding our populations along the way. They're doing the heavy lifting for you in terms of getting the nutrients back to your lawn soils, uh, also back to your tree soils, back to your garden soils, et cetera. They're important in all of your soils. Taking a soil sample and understanding what's in your soil. Even if you have a healthy lawn, it might be good to take a soil sample just in case something in the future happens to your lawn. You'll have a baseline to be able to see what difference is out there. Uh, also, stop any frequent shallow watering. Only water deeply during dry spells or when you're establishing a lawn. Add compost as long as your nutrient laws allow for it and add it as often as possible. And stop adding any synthetic chemicals or fertilizers. Uh, they're really not necessary uh, when we have all of these cultural means and methods that we can take for a healthy lawn. 
with that, I'm going to go ahead and take questions. This is my email in case you'd like to contact me directly. We also have a very expensive website. It's actually a fabulous uh, lawn care website for organic lawn care. So I put our website up there. Feel free to go there. Uh, use as much resources as possible. A lot of videos, a lot of downloads, a lot of information, uh, a lot of ways you can go in there to learn a lot more about organic lawn care. And with that, uh, Penny, I'll go ahead and open it to questions. Very good. We do have a few questions. The first one is, is there a way to eliminate switchgrass in the lawn without chemicals? Yeah, so switch, um, uh, well, you're talking about field grass, right? Switchgrass. The question is about, oh, switchgrass. I'm not sure if somebody meant to write Silk grass, um, but I'll talk about eliminating any weed in the lawn. Uh, silk grass down here is a big problem. It's possible whoever's asking has something called switch grass. Uh, lawn grasses are a little more challenging to, or sorry, invasive grasses are a little more challenging in a lawn to manage than a broadleaf plant, particularly with organic uh, chemicals, if that's what somebody is relying on. But as I mentioned before, the denser the lawn, the better off you are. So nothing and I'll say this again, almost nothing can outcompete a healthy lawn. So we want to focus on getting the soil healthy, and we want to focus on having that lawn be as dense as possible. As I mentioned, you can get up to 6,000 blades of grass in a square foot. If you have a grass that dense, nothing, practically nothing will grow in there, even the clover that you wanted to grow or anything else. So getting that nice and dense, and that might require a heavy overseeding. It might require nutrient management. So you really want to look at your lawn soils and you want to look at having that dense, dense grass that you grow high, that you care for, uh, that you've eliminated all of those watering regimes from, uh, that you're mowing with sharp blades, that you're leaving behind the clippings. Doing all of those things are going to contribute to a dense lawn. So the denser the lawn, the less of a problem. And if you have something, whether it's silk grass, switch grass, or whatever else is going to be in there, if you have a dense lawn and you have a little bit of that growing in there, you should be able to tolerate that little bit that's growing in there because it won't be able to proliferate. Okay, good advice. If you're trying to grow a polyculture lawn to bring more biodiversity to your yard, can you suggest other plants to add uh, by seed other than just clover? This is someone writing in from the Northeast. Sure. I mean, I, I, I'm I talking from, um, from Maryland, but I grew up in Pennsylvania. I lived up in Massachusetts for a little while. So there's not too much in terms of difference of things besides clover that you could add to your lawn. So a lot of people like, like the look of violets in their lawn and violets are a nice uh, spring plant that pops up. It's, you know, a lot of things that grow in lawns, so the one thing that lawns are really not great for is habitat. Um, they are great for a lot of things, but they're never going to compare to a garden or to trees or forests or grasslands. Uh, one thing that I suggest sometimes to people is that if they want some diversity in their lawn in terms of the ability of pollinators to maybe even just hide, burrow, lay eggs, uh, rest, get a little dew drop in the morning, those sorts of things, is to mow your lawn, um, I don't want to say erratically, but let's say you let a, a circle in the middle get a little bit longer so that your clover can flower, maybe your grass can flower, it's going to collect more dew, provide a little bit of a hiding spot, uh, maybe allow for birds to rest in there while they're um, you know, getting worms, and then mow that area and then let the other part of the lawn get a little bit longer. Uh, you don't want it to, you know, become messy for your neighbors, but if you were to have, you know, again, sort of patches and areas that you let it grow longer, you could do that. Um, but the, in terms of things like violets, dandelions, uh, clovers, other broadleaf plants that are typically in a lawn, they're not, except for the clover, they're not typically pollinator magnets. Um, so what I would do is instead suggest that somebody just eliminate a small area of lawn. Um, maybe if you are in a very urban site, you don't have a lot of area, you could get a big planter and you could uh, put your native plants in that planter um, and provide that within, within your lawn area. Uh, but there's not typically a lot of things that are 
going to really increase uh, diversity that much. All right, very good. What can be done to eliminate creeping Jenny? This is a question that we've had many times at ELA. <laughs> yeah, so same thing that I mentioned before about silk grass or any other weed is getting that lawn to be dense. Again, doing all the things we talked about, overseeing fertility management, um, mowing high, all those sorts of things. If you're really getting to a point where you can't maintain a dense lawn uh, because you have, say it's really shady and uh, it's no longer appropriate for a lawn, you might want to start looking at a different ground cover than uh, lawn grasses. Uh, but if it's a good habitat for lawn in general, uh, relatively sunny, partly shady, that sort of thing, again, focusing on that dense lawn, uh, you may for a while with something that you have a problem, might be putting in a little bit more time with manually weeding that out uh, so that you can get that lawn area established. Uh, but again, it's dense lawn, dense lawn, dense lawn. Okay, very good. Uh, do you have any tips on establishing a new lawn in poor weedy soils? Can you say that a little bit more clearly? Any tips on establishing a new lawn in poor, weedy soils? Oh, <laughs> yeah. So, um, so it's actually amazing where grass will grow, but I would start with a soil test for poor soils. Make sure you find out what it's lacking. I would say that you probably need to incorporate a lot of um, healthy, well-aged compost into that soil. Uh, and and you may do, you may, I would always advise overseeding over sod. Uh, the reason for that is that um, sod can, can be great, but it's very, uh, not only very expensive, but it's been grown in full sun with a lot of nutrients being added. It's been babied, it's been cut and traumatized in transport. It can be relatively difficult to establish. Uh, so using a, a fair amount of compost and organic materials, getting that incorporated into your into your poor soils. Again, understanding what is problematic with your soils. And then a, a very good overseeding, very good watering. And then it may take several years of nutrient management to you know, kind of keep that going. Okay, good, good ideas. Are there ways to test compost tea that are similar to soil tests? Uh, my understanding is it can be relatively difficult to test compost tea. It's everything nutrient wise in compost tea is diluted or eliminated. Um, in terms of testing the, the uh, soil biology that might be in there, you want to start with understanding the soil biology that's in your compost. And there are living soil um, tests that you can do to figure out what uh, microorganisms you have in there. Uh, but I'd say in general, if you're working with a healthy, well-aged compost, um, you're going to have a, a pretty healthy compost tea on the on the sort of larger industrial scale where people are doing compost tea across large areas. They tend to use um, need some labs to look at what's in your compost to start, and you can do various things within your compost tea to encourage it to go more fungal or more bacterial. There's a lot of um, information uh, online about that. If you look into Elaine Ingram's information, she has a lot of information about compost and compost tea. Um, and she, she, you know, took a relatively strict line in terms of what's out there. Uh, but I would say for a lot of your average homeowner, uh, the resources are relatively difficult to test that. So as long as you are starting with a healthy compost and um, your compost tea doesn't have a funky smell and you're diluting it well, uh, your chances are low that you're going to hurt the lawn. Um, but you, uh, you may not see benefits, uh, you know, on a certain scale that you might be expecting if you haven't tested it. Okay. Sounds good. Is there a particular type of soil test that you recommend 
if you are interested in learning more about what microorganisms you have and what you need to add. Uh, yeah, I, I've forgotten the name of the lab. There's one, there's one main lab that's um, out, I believe they're on Long Island. You can, I believe you'd be able to find them if you um, do searches with Elaine Ingram uh, through her site because uh, he's uh, used a lot of her um, technology and things like that, but I, I've honestly forgotten what it's called right now. And there may be other labs that are out there doing that. I just haven't kept track of that, so I apologize. I don't have a, a great answer to that. If somebody wants to email me, I can certainly look that up and find that information for them. All right. The next is, can coffee grounds be sprinkled directly on lawn, or do they need to be composted first? You can do either. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dump a pile of them in one spot. Uh, but yeah, you can just sprinkle them right across the lawn. Why not? All right. And can you give us information about what the dilution is? for the blackstrap molasses application? Um, there isn't really. Uh, some people, like I said, um, oh, like Elaine Ingram would probably, she advises against it. Other people advise to it. It's usually just, um, you know, a dollop of it. Uh, if you're just doing blackstrap molasses, you're not doing compost tea. Uh, they're there may be dilution rates out there, but you know, probably a capful, you know, capful or two in a gallon is probably enough. Um, I don't. I've never heard stories of somebody just taking blackstrap molasses and just pouring it out on the lawn. Um, in that case, you you might. I don't think you could burn the soil with it, but it would probably be very expensive. So um, you know, probably just you know a, a dollop and you know dollop or two in a quart or a gallon, and and you're probably good to go. Okay. So, yeah, I would say you know check check the web for some reputable um, experience that people have had on that. All right, sounds good. And we have one last question: Do you have recommendations for pest control such as grubs without chemicals? Yeah, so actually, um, grubs are kind of an interesting, an interesting critter. So uh, one of the reasons why the, the grubs can get there is that the beetle found a place to land and lay an egg. So I, I oftentimes go back to having that dense lawn because the denser the lawn, the less bare soil there is for the beetle to actually lay an egg in that soil. Uh, so you want to be able to prevent them from coming that area in the first place. So that's you know step one. Fertility management is another step that you can go in there and uh, deal with actually a very healthy lawn. You can have five to ten grubs per square foot and not have any damage from it. So, uh, again, I'm talking about a healthy lawn. It's the unhealthy lawns where we start seeing damage from grubs uh, because fertility is off. Um, people might have added nutrients. Um, like an abundance of nitrogen, and then you get this fast-growing uh, soft tissue of the roots, and that's more tasty to those, you know, to the grubs that might be there, and they, you know, sort of go hog wild and maybe pig out a little bit more than they normally would. And there are a lot of um, there are a lot of grub treatments out there that are organic. If um, if people want to email me, I can give you a link on our website of where you can find some of those organic grub treatments, at least the ones that are licensed in Maryland. Uh, so there are some resources out there. But again, I would say, you know, fertility management is really the basis for everything. Every pest except for weeds is essentially a nutrient problem. Very good. And I will add the person interested in more information about grubs, if you go to ecolandscaping.org and search for grubs, you will find an extensive article written by Bruce Wenning on different types of grubs and a lot of information about treatments. So, so thank you. That's great. Thanks. Thank you for all of this information. It certainly is, is great to hear the tips and resources to help us create healthy lawns that are good for people and pets and pollinators and the planet. So thank you, Mary.
no problem. And again, like I mentioned, feel free, uh, anybody can email me and I'm happy to help answer more questions.